Okay, we are going to continue with another Q and A. One of the passages that uh, comes up in, is um, the question of how to understand Second Thessalonians chapter two. Now, I could spend a lot of time in telling you what other people say and um, the different interpretations that people will have with this passage, but I think the might be more instructive instead of spending a whole hour or something like that on that. Maybe there's a time for that. Um, I would just want to give you proper context and um, show you the right way to understand this, one way you can understand this, because the question comes up whether or not um, this affects the rapture or not, and if this passage is about the rapture and when the rapture happens, because many people will insist and use this passage to prove through various means that, well, that must mean the rapture is not until the very end of the tribulation. Um, so is this really the way to understand this? And so many will um, jump in right away and do, say, verse 3, somewhere here, read down. But for proper context, let's go ahead and go back, okay? Um, let's go back to chapter 1 and get the context of what's being discussed. Um, various commentaries will tell us that part of the reason why Paul had to write this letter, um, as we understand it, is because some folks, and it says this here in the text, were spreading a rumor that, that bird has flown the coop. That's done. You guys missed it. It's over. Um, you know, you guys already missed that time. So people were freaking out, going, "Wait, what? We missed it." Uh, so, you know, what kind of conclusions can you leap to with that? Um, they didn't have the Book of Revelation. They didn't have not all the books were in circulation yet in the New Testament. So there, there was creating a lot of confusion. A lot of confusion. But let's look at this, the context of this, though. So, um, he, in the, the Thanksgiving, Paul starts in chapter 1, verse 3. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly, and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. That's awesome. Therefore, we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions that you are enduring. The first century was not for sissies. This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering. Since indeed God consider, considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you. In other words, God's going to get them, okay? Because they afflict you. And to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. So now, Jesus being revealed from heaven with his mighty angels when he's being revealed, we have the book of Revelation. That's what the whole book is about. And when he, in the book of Revelation, is he going to be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels? We could jump, jump right to chapter 19. That's second coming. This isn't a rapture passage at all. He's revealed. So it isn't just he's coming or he's coming part way to catch up Harpazo, snatch away the church, um, at, at some uh, different time. This is the actual second coming here. Um, so he's revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, and for context to verify this, we keep reading, in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Absolutely second coming. He doesn't do any of that at a rapture event. He comes to snatch the bride of Christ off the face of the earth, but when he comes down and we read in Joel and Zechariah and various passages that um, and when he goes through the valley of, of decision, he goes through the armies that are gathered there for Armageddon and, and um, the ground melts under his feet and the blood splatters up um, on his horse's hoofs and on the bottom of his robe. That's what this is. This is Revelation 19 stuff here. So this is absolutely second coming stuff. So then we have our context. They will suffer 
the punishment of eternal destruction and, and from the presence of the Lord um, and from the glory of his might. When he comes on that day, so now we're talking about the specific 24-hour day, the actual penultimate event when he returns, as we've just read, to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. To this end, we always pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power so that the name of the Lord Jesus Christ might be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's continue on because it's part of the context. So now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, we already know we're talking about the second coming. We're not talking about him coming in the clouds and us meeting him in the air like the rapture. Second coming, because this is the context, right? Chapter one, we just read. Um, I could do this actually. I apologize. You can read along with me, but this is the ESV version. Okay, so now we get down to the get get, get down to the old Kaiba rifles here with uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now concerning the coming of our, our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming, seeming to be from us, meaning one of us apostles, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. So he just told us what the day of the Lord was going to look like in chapter 1. So he's, don't freak out about people claiming to be speaking for us or have a letter or some spirit comes to somebody or something. Um, let no one deceive you in any way, verse 3. For that day, what day? Second coming again with all fire, glory, and vengeance. Unless the rebellion comes first. Okay, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. Well, yeah, that happens back in the tribulation period, right? The Antichrist is there from the very beginning. He'll, he'll enforce an agreement, get the temple built, all that kind of stuff. and He'll come in the name of the Lord. But then by the middle of the week, as we see Daniel 9.27, in the middle of the week, uh, even though he's had the temple built, he's going to stop the sacrifices and he's going to desecrate the temple. There are a lot of events that happened at that point in time. And that's another study. It's a fascinating study. But that is the time of great tribulation that Jesus spoke of. And Jesus referred to this in Matthew 24 too. He talks about this being the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel. That's what Jesus says. Okay, So says that all has got to happen first. Yes, that all happens before the second coming. This isn't rapture. Uh, so he opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God. See, this is mid-tribulation, in the middle of the week, um, proclaiming himself to be God. Don't you remember that when I was still there, I told you about these things? You guys forgetting what I told you? And you know what is restraining him now, so that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. So we know that there are demonic, demonic forces in the world, and we fight a spiritual battle. We know this. Uh, Paul talked about this in Ephesians chapter 6, right? Um, only he who now restrains it, this evil, this lawlessness, will do so until he is out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. So here we're talking about the uh, Lord Jesus um, killing those involved, um, the Antichrist and the false prophet, with the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan. Satan gets kicked out of heaven, right, in chapter 12 of Revelation, and then he will possess the Antichrist, effectively creating the beast um, with all power, false signs, and wonders. So we find the beast first mentioned in the middle of the tribulation, and that's what happens. Just like Satan possessed uh, Judas. And with all wicked deception for those who are preaching because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth 
but have pleasure in unrighteousness. So what happens is, um, as we see up here, um, eventually God will destroy and kill with the breath of his mouth. The first inhabitants we find in Revelation at the end of chapter 19 and going into chapter 20, the first inhabitants of the lake of fire without even any benefit of going to the great white throne judgment first after the millennium will be the Antichrist and the false prophet. Boom, lake of fire. They don't even, they're not even going into Hades first or outer darkness. Like in the sheep and goats judgment, that's completely different. So the first inhabitants, there's nobody in the lake of fire yet right now. That doesn't happen until the great white throne judgment, except for these two. So this is second coming. This is nothing about the rapture and Jesus coming and rapturing anybody. This is all second coming stuff after um, this season that he's speaking about here in the man of lawlessness is so he's going back three and a half years and looking at the whole great tribulation says not set there's no second coming yet is what he's telling them don't be alarmed don't be shaken in your faith all right day's not going to happen we ain't even seen the antichrist yet all this stuff's got to happen first so don't freak out that hasn't even happened that's going to be some big events though all of that the uh See, the book of Revelation hadn't even been written yet, so they don't even know about the seals and the trumpets and the bowls and the three woes and all those things. They're clueless. So Paul is telling them here, um, I don't even know if here Paul knows about all that, those details yet, because the Lord reveals them to John later, at about 90 or 95 AD. So uh, all this all this stuff has got to happen first. This is what he's telling them. Just don't freak out. Jesus spoke about this in Matthew 24, and Daniel spoke about it. This has got to happen first, and that's in the middle of the week. We haven't even seen that yet. It's what he's telling them. So calm down, people. You haven't missed it. So, um, because folks seem to think, that, and I don't know why people are all pushing, like, I, I mean, do you really want to go through that time? What, you know, Revelation 3.10, Jesus says, I'm going to save you out of it. I'm going to remove you from all that, that time that's going to come upon those who dwell on the earth. It's going to be a time of trial, testing that comes upon the whole world. And it's, I, I'm going to remove you from that. And it's going to come upon those who dwell on the earth. So that means we don't dwell on the earth. So either God is planning on sending a giant space shuttle to get his people off, or we will have been raptured by the time that tri time of trial happens. We'll get it. We'll do another study to show that that it is a full seven-year tribulation period and the different things that point to that. Um, but um, I wanted to answer this and get this out of the way. Now, here's a here's a logic thing, um, not just logic in a vacuum, but looking at all the different passages in the Old Testament about the things that are supposed to happen in the kingdom. Jesus rules with a rod of iron. Um, why? What is going to take care of lawlessness, right? We have a, a young child will lead them. We have a child will be able to sit in a viper pit and play with the vipers and not be bitten. Um, we'll have um, nations, countries who, if they don't go up on, on the king's highway and go to Jerusalem during the Feast of Tabernacles, God's going to shut their rain off as a form of discipline. So we have sin going on. Um, Satan is bound, and his, his demons, by extension, they're bound, so we can't anymore we can't say the devil made me do it. During the millennial time, um, Jesus will be ruling with a rod of iron, but there will still be sin, and there will still be sin, sinners. Okay, so here's the problem, is if, if you have the um, tribulation right here, um, and it ends... And you have the rapture right here, and then the tribulation's ended, and people are raptured. What happens? What does First Corinthians fifteen about verse fifty and following talk about? How we'll all be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, and so forth, and how we'll be glorified. Um, so that means we'll have the sheep and the goats judgment also after the tribulation. The sheep, Matthew twenty-five, is a great one for that. Sheep are all gathered on his right. The goats all go to his left. And um, 
those on his right, he says, you know, enter, enter into, into the kingdom. The goats, outer darkness. So you have only believers at that point, right? But they've all been glorified. You have Old Testament saints. So you got first resurrection. You got the Old Testament saints being raised. But everybody's in their glorified bodies by this point. Who are the mortals that go into the kingdom? That's the big logic problem that you have with post-tribulation rapture. Everybody's been raptured. It's all over. Everybody's got glorified bodies. Now you have no mortals to go into the kingdom to make the babies. you got to have babies who are going to grow up to be unbelievers. Satan is released after a thousand years. He'll gather together an army and go up against Jerusalem one last time, just like Gog and Magog tried. But Jesus says he's going to put him down with a word. So who's Satan going to recruit after a thousand years? You've had no babies, nobody to make babies, no mortals. So that's a, a big logic problem. So no, you have to have you have to have the uh, the rapture sooner than that. Um, now some people will argue mid trib, pre wrath, um, pre trib, all this other kind of stuff. We'll do a, a separate one on the rapture and the timing of the rapture. We'll try to approach it the same way. What does the scripture say? And how can we apply the scripture we already know? And how can we apply some logic to what we know about that? But anyway, so that's the end of that. See, it didn't run that long. Um, so that's Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Not a rapture event. Second coming event is what that's about. All right. God bless. Have a great day. Great evening. Please subscribe. Please like. And uh, let folks know if you enjoy the content here. God bless.